All right, thank you, Alex. All right, we're gonna go ahead and call the special Tempe City Council meeting to order uh, virtually on June 11, 2020. It's a special meeting for uh, a special council meeting and it states the following. So I just wanna make sure people understand that we have received a considerable amount, uh, number of comments or requests to speak. And the final item on this agenda, I ask for everyone to please be patient as we go through the first three agenda items as required by state statute. Although we are adopting a budget, it is simply to meet the time requirements set forth by the state statute. Due to the severe economic impact from COVID-19, there will be additional future budget sessions to identify budget cuts and the public input and participation option is being developed as well. Um, I would like, uh, just so everyone knows that any council member that has a conflict of interest may abstain from voting on the matter that we're going to be addressing tonight and the city clerk will provide the council members with a disclosure form. So the first item is a public hearing to adopt a resolution adopting fiscal years 2020-21 through 2020-24-25 capital improvement program. And I would now like to turn it over to Ken Jones, who is our deputy city manager and chief financial officer for a briefing. Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. Ken Jones, deputy city manager and CFO. Uh, the, your first item on this special agenda is the our um, charter required approval of a five-year capital improvement program. This is the five-year planning tool. It is not the budget. The budget is a one-year budget approval. So this is your five-year planning tool for only capital improvements. And you've uh, been briefed on this and there's a lot of information in your packet. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Jones. I would now, this is a public hearing item. I now turn to Ms. Reese, Carla. Madam Clerk, do we have anything? Mr. Mayor, we have no comments for this specific item. Okay. Is there any comments or discussion from the council on this item? Mr. Mayor, it's yes. Vice Mayor Kuby. Um, just want to see if there's interest in the council in advancing the purchase of a um, 250 unit either motel or um, apartment complex to become permanent supportive housing with wraparound services. Um, the only, I only bring this up because there have been some opportunities brought to us that didn't pan out, but with the extreme impacts of COVID on some you know, local motels, there may be opportunities that pop up earlier than the 21 slash 22 fiscal year, or there may be funding opportunities that come from the federal government from COVID Care Act relief. So, you know, I don't know whether we could talk about this tonight, um, but just to keep open that, I want to just know what is, can we keep it open if there's an opportunity that avails us in advance this in CIP at some point, if we're presented with a golden opportunity? Golden opportunity, can you, I don't know we have any right now. No, as I mentioned, you know, we, are, we had some opportunities early on when we had a, um, a motel approach us about us purchasing, you know, leasing out the rooms and then purchasing them for permanent supportive housing. So that opportunity did not pan out. There may be other opportunities. I know we're currently looking for them. There may be funding opportunities that come from the outside from federal government. And I wanted just that to be available to us. And I didn't know if that means we should be, are we locking ourselves in? Can we advance that goal, which is now in 21, 22 ca capital improvements program. Can we advance it? Um, how did that, how would that work? Should an opportunity present itself? It may be a, sure. Before I go to Jim, I'm going to go back to uh, Councilman Navarro. Thank you, Mayor. Um, no, I would be, you know, always supportive of any golden opportunity or uh, a potential of something that we could help utilize um, for our community and, and really to make some impact within the homeless community. So I, I would be open to that. However, um, I know for our budget purposes, um, just on the fly right now, um, I could not support it, but I do understand that if an opportunity does exist, and Ken might be able to explain this, I think we have an opportunity to make some adjustments, but with adjustments means that some other projects will not be funded 
um, within the capital budget. So I, I believe we still have those opportunities. Uh, Council Member Erdano Savage, and I'm going to go after you. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I, I, I guess I understand my concerns, like I say, with, with uh, Council Member Navarro, right? I, I always think there's, we should be able to have some flexibilities for any type of golden opportunity, especially if it's something to advance a priority of ours, a strategic priority that, uh, you know, maybe we're not uh, fulfilling like we should. So. I certainly understand that, but I think this this late in time, I'm I'm not willing or, or comfortable um, without more discussion and really realizing where our gaps are, and if this is something uh, that would rise to the level of a top priority. So, uh, with that said, right now I, I'm I'm not willing to second that recommendation. Thank you. I just want to. Uh, I, I, I kind of agree with Councilman Navarro and Councilman Erdano Savage. The only thing I I do know is that uh, Lauren, can you mute your microphone, please? The only thing, and until you want to, we can speak. Um, the only thing that I know we can look at. You know, we we are limited capacity as it is. That's why we are going out for a bond election in November. So as Councilman Navarro mentioned that something would have to give in the CIP in order to do that at, the, at this time. And I don't know of any opportunity, but I know that we're always innovative. So if an opportunity does come up, we will find creative ways to look at a potential golden opportunity if there is one. I know that's one of the, the I think the beauties of this council and our staff, how we look for creative ways when opportunities do exist or come about. Um, and it is, you know, obviously we're looking at our strategic priorities and obviously affordable housing and uh, human services is up at, at the top of the list. So with that, I, at this time, based on the current situation that we have, um, does it mean that this cannot come up at a future date if an opportunity does exist? Uh, but just to identify something without knowing anything that's there, giving the limited capacity within our budget, uh, for capital projects, which is why we have to go back out for a uh, bond authorization to use expenditures that we are currently collecting. Um, we're already at that limit. I would actually turn, and I believe there is some money right now in our budget uh, for that use, but I don't know the exact total. I believe so. Mayor, this is Ken Jones, if you want me to comment. Yeah, Ken, I was just going to turn to you next. Uh, Ken Jones, Deputy City Manager, CFO. So the project that's currently in the CIP is a, a total $26 million project. We assume 5.7 million in GO bonds. We don't have GO bond capacity next year to fund that. In order to fund that 5.7, we would have to remove 5.7 from general governmental uh, bond funded projects, which would be a large majority of them. So we put it in the second year, assuming that it would then be included in the request for bond authorization that will occur in November. And again, we're assuming right now 5.7 million GO bonds plus $26 million federal funding, as, as Vice Mayor Kubi said, if we can lever, leverage federal program money to get that, uh, that, that's something we would look at. But to put, but to assume that we might do that next year means that we would have to put that 5.7 million GO bonds in the budget for that project, which would which would eliminate all of those other projects that total that amount in general governmental. So that's why it isn't in next year. It's as you stated, Mayor. It's a uh, bond authorization capacity issue. Oh, okay, thank you, Ken. Uh, Vice Mayor Kiwi. Yes, thank you, Ken, for the explanation. I understand. Um, I know we were looking at an opportunity that came to us early in the COVID crisis, and I imagine we'd have to work around, you know, the funds needed by if this opportunity did come to us earlier um, with some kind of rental or some kind of, you know, um, program where we weren't necessarily buying but renting. So thank you for the clear explanation. I just look forward to any opportunity um, to pursue when that does come before us again. Okay. To approve on the on the record, the fiscal years 2021 through 2024 25 capital improvements program. It's moved by Vice Mayor QB. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilman Navarro. I'm going to do a roll call vote. 
Councilman Navarro. Aye. Councilmember Keating. Yes. Councilmember Chin. Aye. Vice Mayor Kiwi. Aye. Councilmember Erdano Savage. Aye. Councilmember Adams. Aye. I vote aye as well. That motion passes seven to zero. The next item is item number two, which is to hold a public hearing to require under the state's truth and taxation statute and adopt a resolution indicating the city's intention to adopt a primary property tax levy that excluding amounts related to new construction will be greater than last year's primary tax levy. Uh, this is a public hearing item, but I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Ken Jones, our deputy city manager and chief financial officer, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mayor. This is a statutory requirement. We know that we have a, a tax, a property tax stabilization policy that states that our total property tax for existing property, the levy will in total only increase by the rate of inflation. This is the primary portion of the property tax that can go up by up to 2% in additional levy because the inflation has been less than the property value growth in recent years. We have reduced our rate in each of the last several years so that all we collect from existing property owners is the additional levy related to inflation. So this is in line with your policy to maintain a stabilized property tax levy. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any public comments for the item number two? Mayor, we received no submissions for this item. All right. I look to my council colleagues. Any comments or discussion or a motion on item number two? Moved. Moved by, is that Councilman Joel or Navarro? Councilman Navarro. Moved by Councilman Navarro. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Ken. We're going to do roll call vote. Councilman Navarro. Aye. Council Member Keating. Yes. Councilmember Chin. Aye. Vice Mayor Kiwi. Aye. Councilmember Arredondo Savage. Aye. Councilmember Adams. Councilmember Adams. Aye. I vote aye as well. That motion passes seven to zero. Next item on our agenda is item number three, which is to introduce and hold the first public hearing to adopt a final fiscal year 2021 property tax ordinance. The second and final public hearing is scheduled for June 25th, 2020. This is a public hearing item. Is there any comments, Madam Clerk, on item number three? No comments for item number three, Mayor. All right, we'll close that portion. Is there any uh, other public comments? Any questions from the council? I just wanted to let everybody know this is only the first public hearing on this item and no vote will be taken tonight on item number three. Um, any council members have any discussions on this item? Seeing none. I'll make a motion to approve. Well, there, there's no motion. This is just oh. the first hearing. The second, oh, we're gonna sorry. hear this on the 25th of June. With that, we're gonna move on to item number four, to hold a public hearing to adopt a resolution containing estimates of proposed expenditures by the city of Tempe for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2020 and ending June 30th, 2021 and declare as such, uh, uh, constitute a final budget for the city of Tempe for said fiscal year. This is a public hearing item. I will now turn it over to Ken Jones, our deputy city manager and our chief financial officer, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. I'm gonna to try to briefly explain exactly where we are in our budget process this year. The budget process is anything but normal. Uh, typically this time of year, you would be approving the final budget here, but we would have had a lot of public input. We would have held public uh, forums and we would have gathered as much information as possible to help you in approving the budget, which typically would have increased over the prior year. Because of the anticipated decline in our revenues, we know that we are going to have to reduce our budget for next year. But this has come on so quickly that the city council has directed us to take the time necessary to gather as much input from the public as possible. So tonight's budget approval is merely a formality required by state statute so that we can approve the, the uh, final budget tonight, which will establish the ceiling of what we can spend next year. 
We know that this budget that will be approved tonight is the upper limits of what the city can spend and doesn't represent what we intend to spend the next year because it needs to be adjusted. In order to adjust the budget, we've set a meeting to start that process on June 25th, where the city council will consider staff's recommendations for adjusting the budget. By that time, we will have gathered a bunch of information from the public and from our employees as well. As we speak, there is a public forum available on our website, and we invite the public to go to the website. You can see the budget as, it's, as it is approved tonight, as it is proposed for approval tonight, as well as pages of adjustments proposed by staff for the city council to consider on June 25th. We also will gather all of the online uh, information that comes from the Tempe Public Forum that we will gather for you. And we also invite people to attend virtually or send in comments for that June 25th meeting. As I stated, Mayor, we could have tried to rush through the adjustments, presented them to you tonight to try to get the final budget as close as we can to what we expect to spend next year. But that's not how we do things, and that's not what you expect. You expect to get as much public input as possible, which is why tonight is merely that formality. As I said, the Tempe Forum is active now and we invite the public to provide those comments. I wanna talk about a little bit about the budget process. Our budget is performance-based, which means resources are allocated to achieve the outcomes identified by the city council. We know that we don't just budget across the board we budget based on those outcomes identified by the city council. And if I could, I'd like to just read you a quick list that I, that I jotted down here of examples of how that has worked in the past. Programs and services that the city council has placed an emphasis on and said to staff, allocate funding necessary to achieve these outcomes. Examples are the CARE 7 crisis response team, the social service nonprofit agency review funding, sustainability office and, off and sustainability director, homeless coordinator, homeless outreach with wraparound services. We created an urban forest program. We have students, uh, student counselors in our schools funded by the city. We have a pre-K program, kids zone before and after school program, free youth transit passes for all Tempe students. We have a mayor's youth advisory commission that helps provide input from our uh, youngsters in school. We have, a create, we have created and expanded the free orbit bus service, federal housing assistance from the general fund to supplement that federal housing. We created a Tempe Works program so that employees who are ho or people who are homeless could become active employees in the city of Tempe. Affordable workforce housing development incentives, school resource officers in all of our high schools and junior high schools, African American Advisory Commission, Diversity Steering Committee, and we have community counseling free and low cost to Tempe residents. Mayor, those are just examples of the way it has worked in the past where the mayor and council have said, these are the outcomes we desire and find the budget to fund those. And that's how it has worked. And, and, that's, uh, and, and it has been very successful for the city of Tempe. So likewise, now that we're in budget reduction mode, which we've gone through, through in the past, when we're in budget uh, reduction mode, we take a similar uh, tact. We don't say, let's do across the board cuts and cut every department equally. We also don't shift money based on the city council saying, move this amount here or that amount there. Instead, we go to the city council and say, we have taken a thorough process in our departments to identify not the funding that should be eliminated, but the programs and services and positions that should be scaled back to achieve the budget reductions that are necessary. So what we'll be asking you for on the 25th of June is we will present you with those proposed reductions. We will present you with all of the input we've received from the community, and we will ask you in terms of outcomes, how would you like to adjust our budget? So uh, in short, Mayor, I'm gonna sum up one more time because it's important for the community to understand this. This is a formality tonight to have to approve this final budget. And I wouldn't encourage any of you to approve this budget unless you have complete confidence that on June 25th, we'll be back in a meeting similar to this, adjusting this budget and contemplating the feedback that you've gotten from the residents. And I know you know that that's exactly what will happen.
I, I'm happy to answer any questions, Mayor. Thank you, Ken. Uh, before we go to the, my council colleagues, I'm going to turn over to Madam Clerk, Ms. Reese. Uh, I know we have some public comment cards. I will turn to you now. Mayor, we have several, we have 265 comment cards that I'm going to aggregate by subject, but we have several live speakers that I would recommend go first out of consideration for their time. And Brian Messinas would be the first in the queue. Okay, and before we do that, Brian, thank you for being here. But before we do that, because of the number of participants, we're going to go from five, it's going to be a three minute time limit per speaker. Mr. Messinas. He has been unmuted, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Messinas. Brian, are you there? Brian. He has raised his hand. Brian, can you, I have unmuted you. Can you check if your phone is unmuted? Um, Brian, you there? We'll go back to Brian if we can, is there another person in the queue? Yeah, Kieran Brennan and then Nanelli Morales. Karen Brennan, she was on. Uh, we have her comment card. Carla, would you be able to read that? I'll read it when I read the others into the record. Okay, Brian, are you there? Brian Messinas. All right. Any, is there another live speaker, uh, Madam Clerk? Nalili Morales. Uh, Ms. Morales. Please state your name and place of residence for the record. Hello. Hello. Who's this? This is Brian. Oh, Brian. Please state your name and place of residence for the record. And you have a, you have three minutes, Mr. Messinas. Hello, Mayor and Council. My name is Brian Messinas. I'm a student at the ASU campus and live on the Tempe campus as a CA at ASU. I'm here speaking to you as a constituent who is disturbed by the injustices and brutality carried out by police forces across the country, including the Tempe PD. The current city budget recommendation for police is nearly $103 million, or roughly $4 million. 4 million increase from last year's budget. Ending police brutality should be a budget priority. Justice should be a budget priority. Health and safety, which are proven to be better promoted through social programs and education than policing, should be a priority. Police forces across the country have proven that diversifying and implementing various trainings have not and will not end police brutality. The police should not and cannot be the answer to everything in this city, especially not when the police can't even be trusted to be honest or transparent. I was at the Tempe Listens meeting in March where Chief Moore lied to those present in saying that Tempe PD did not own a Stingray when in fact they do, and uh, also denied the use of which Tempe PD has used their LRAD on uh, folks in Tempe. We have seen no justice or meaningful change since the shooting of Antonio Ars and the recent story coming to light of a black mother calling 911 for her son's mental health crisis only to be met with excessive and violent display of riot shields and rifles by Tempe PD clearly showing the drastic lack of alternatives to policing for situations like these. What we need from you as representatives of the city is to acknowledge and accept the clear option in front of you that many community members are demanding and express support for today at the march taking place in downtown Tempe. That is defunding the Tempe police and redirecting a meaningful portion of their budget to social services, cultural programs, education, and sustainability, which are the backbones of any healthy community. What we don't need is more empty words and actions and turning lights on in certain buildings when you have the power to be making actual change in this city that is tangible and will save the lives of black and brown communities in this city and in the surrounding areas for years to come. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brian. Uh, our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Jordan Aguilar. All right, Jordan, please state your name and place of residence for the record, please. You have, a, you have three minutes. Go ahead, Jordan, you're unmuted. Jordan, you there? Hello, Jordan. I put the, the trees in. You're on. We hear you. Jordan, are you there? 
All right, we need, to go, we need to go to the next speaker. The speaker is if, if you have your, if you submitted your comment card, uh, please be ready to speak if you can. Madam Clerk, can you speak to please? On hello, Cesar. All right. Can you state your name and place of residence for the record, please? Please. She is not present. Okay. Next one, uh, Ms. Reese. Vicki Peer. All right, Vicki, please state your name and place of residence for the record. Hi, my name is Vicki Peer, and I am a resident of Tempe. Um, I am here to talk about the fact that I am currently serving on the Mayor's Commission on Disability Concerns, and I am really concerned about the proposed budget for the upcoming fiscal year. The 102 million for Tempe PD is more than the Community Services Fund and the Human Services Fund put together. There is so much evidence-based research that demonstrates the deadly reality that people with disabilities, specifically people who are living with developmental disabilities or psychiatric disabilities and people who are deaf and hard of hearing are exponentially more likely to have violent and deadly interactions with police than are their non-disabled or hearing peers. And of course, we all know that People who are not white, people who are poor, people who are experiencing homelessness have the highest rates of violent interactions with police. The black residents of Tempe, indigenous residents, undocumented residents, and other residents of color, especially those who have disabilities or who live with people, people in their homes who have disabilities, need to be able to have fewer interactions with police in order to be safe. It's not a cure-all, but it really is as simple as that. The fewer the interactions with police, the safer disabled people can be. So one way that you, the city council, can help these residents be safer is to cut funding for the police and redistribute those funds to other areas of the budget. Like the city council in Minneapolis, Tempe could become a leading example of what really is possible when elected officials listen to their constituents, especially those who are most likely to have interactions with police wherein the residents themselves are the ones who experience violence, excessive force, and even death. So I hope that in the next month of public comments and consideration, you truly prioritize the people who are most likely to have negative, violent, and deadly interactions with police, and then allocate funds differently accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Ms. Reese, the next speaker. We have Sarah Tacola, and she has a congregation with her. They're going to be using the same device, but she'll be the first up to speak, and Alex is reaching out to contact her right now. Sarah, uh, please state your name and place of residence for the record, and you have three minutes. The system is still calling her right now. She has not picked up. Okay. Can we can you try for Alexandra. Can, can we go to the next speaker? Alexandra Monti. All right, Alexandra, uh, you have three minutes. Please state your name and place of residence for the record. Alexandra, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Hello? Alexandra? All right, next speaker, please, Carla, Ms. Reese. Joel Cornejo but he's also listed on Sarah's list. I'm not sure if he's on or not. Yeah, but if Sarah's speaking, if, if there's only one person that can speak. Joel is not listed as an attendee right now. Okay. Sandra Ojeda. Sandra, are you there? Sandra is not listed. Eileen Lynch is A I S L I N G. Eileen, are you there? Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. This is Alex Monty. Yeah, but... Are you okay? You go, you have three minutes, Alex. Please state your name and place of residence for the record. Thank you. Um, I'm Alex Monty. I'm a third generation resident of Tempe. I'm a graduate of ASU and I'm currently living in the Broadmoor neighborhood, which is zip code 85282. I also served on your sustainability commission for three years. And in 2015, I was arrested by Tempe police. Um, I'd just like to briefly share my experience. So unbeknownst to me, the police were dispatched to my home in response to a complaint from a te my tenant. When they arrived, I had no idea who was banging at my door. I was in my bedroom alone. 
I walked out to the hallway with a knife in hand because this is what women do when they're home alone and think that someone's breaking in. Because I did not immediately answer my door, the police began breaking it in. At this point, I realized it was the police and still terrified, I immediately just put the knife down and opened the door for them, which wasn't easy as they were pounding through it with a battering ram. When I opened the door with my hands outstretched, the officer grabbed my wrists, wrapped my arms behind my back. These aggressive actions scared the living hell out of me. I still had no idea why they were called to my home. I tensed up, I started shouting for my neighbors to come and help me. The officer pushed me to the pavement and two of them got on top of me. They threatened to taser me if I didn't calm down. This was the same month that Sandra Bland was murdered by, in police custody, and that's all I could think about. I still have the scars on my arms where I was pressed against the pavement until I was bleeding, but I felt lucky that I walked away with my life. I didn't learn why I was even arrested until the following day when I faced a judge. The police had charged me with felony aggravated assault with a deadly weapon because I held a knife in fear to defend myself from unknown assailants in my own home. Last year, my father, who was raised in Tempe and living in South Tempe, had a psychotic breakdown. The police were dispatched to pick him up from an alleyway where he had fallen while trying to climb a wall. He was arrested and put in a cell despite complaining of severe pain after his fall. The officers ignored his complaints and the following morning he lay on the ground unable to stand up with a broken hip. The officer kicked him and said, you walked in here yesterday so you can walk out now. Dismissive, combative, traumatizing, and violent are all words that I would use to describe the Tempe PD. They are disrespectful, incapable of de-escalation, and they ruin lives. They need, there needs to be accountability and there needs to be change. I vote no on the proposed city budget. And thank you for listening. I'm happy to provide more feedback before June 25th. Denise Johnson. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes Denise, you have, you have up to uh, three minutes. Please state your name and place of residence for the record. Okay, my name's Denise Johnson and I'm a 15 year resident of Tempe. Uh, you began the council meeting with almost nine minutes of silence for George Floyd and then promptly gave announcements regarding Juneteenth. Uh, you right now have the opportunity to show the residents of Tempe that these gestures were not simply empty platitudes. Black and brown communities nationwide have called for a reduction in funding to police departments and for that funding to be diverted to more proactive avenues. I support the demands put forth by Black Lives Matter Phoenix Metro and Samias to reduce Tempe PD funding by $22.5 million and allotting those dollars towards free transit passes for all Tempe residents in the amount of $5 million, $3 million to fully fund the free pre-K program, and $14.5 million to Tempe's affordable housing trust fund. I understand that with COVID-19, budgets may need to be cut, However, I ask that you fully fund these programs first and reduce police funding as needed so as to be under required spending limits. If the police find themselves in need of additional cash, I would strongly recommend selling all of their acquired military type weapons and accessories, uh, such as the stingray that was mentioned earlier and not approving any of the requests for new unnecessary violent weapons to be used against Tempe citizens. Please take this opportunity to take real action rather than attempt to pacify Tempe citizens with the same empty platitudes we were subject to after the murders of Dalvin Hollins and Antonio Arce by the Tempe Police Department. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. 
Matthew Mansfield. Matthew, you there? One moment, Mayor. I'm lo locating him now. One second. Okay. Matthew, go ahead. You've been unmuted. Matthew, you have up to three okay, minutes. Thank you. Uh, Please state your name and place of residence for the record, Matthew. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. My name is Matthew Mansfield. I'm a citizen and resident of Tempe, Arizona. Uh, I, I worked as a 911 operator for over 10 years before becoming a police officer. After serving for over 15 years for my community, I've come to know that funding must be taken away from the Tempe Police Department. I'm, I have a, quite a history and a bunch of emotion behind this. Uh, I'll just read my comments to you and won't go into too many details. But I, I submit that we take funding away from the police and move these funds to other resources that may actually do some good for our community. Uh, there are no current checks and balances in our law enforcement system. Uh, good officers are bound by media policies. Uh, they have no personal or legal protections, and therefore they cannot explain to the public what's really happening with all of our tax dollars. Uh, we have officers that are committing unspeakable acts day in and day out, and when good officers try to report these horrible acts, the very men and women that they're reporting are the ones who are assigned to investigate themselves. Uh, the police cannot investigate themselves. Departments hide behind every law, and they conceal all their acts, uh, and they do that because their very funding depends upon the community not really knowing what's going on. Uh, command staff constantly spins the narrative, and when they control the flow of information through binding their employees by their uh, media policies and by laws that are in place, they constantly cast themselves in the best light possible, making all others the ones that are wrong but themselves. When law enforcement agencies want more money, they fudge their numbers to make things appear safer. I've witnessed this. I've witnessed this happening. We cannot trust the information the police report because they are reporting it, and we aren't verifying it. We have no means to verify it. We need outside checks and balances placed upon the police, period. We need outlets for good cops to report bad players, and we need to institute protections for those who do so. We need funding for external affairs to investigate police complaints instead of more funding for more of the same. Now is the time when we have their attention. Now is when we have the control. Now is when we can enact change, and now is when we can say enough is enough. We cannot have justice for all if we allow some to decide justice for themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. We have Grace Carlson. Grace, please state your name and place of residence for the record, please. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, my name is Grace Carlson and I'm a PhD student at ASU um, and a resident of Tempe. I'm here today representing nearly a dozen members of the ASU School of Earth and Space Exploration's Prison Education Program. Um, what our group does is teaches Earth and Space Science classes to inmates of Arizona prisons in order to promote education among an underserved incarcerated community. Um, which reduces the chances of reincarceration in the future. We are speaking to you today regarding the budget for the 2020 2021 fiscal year, specifically the nearly 103 million allocated to the Tempe Police Department. We support the reallocation of these funds to go towards the Community Services Fund, which are currently only being allocated nearly 39 million and just over 46 million, respectively. The police are being overfunded and these community-centered funds are vastly underfunded. Services offered by these funds reduce the need for police action in the near and long term, contributing to the, perpet the perpetuation of peace rather than conflict. As volunteers working to promote education as a means to improve the lives of prisoners while reducing the chances of repeat offenders, we feel that programs emphasizing adequate, affordable housing, education, after-school care, mental health, and trauma services and accessible health care are critical to reducing the prevalence of crime in our community. The benefits to the community of outcomes like these far outweigh the benefits of an overfunded police department, which reacts to crime rather than preventing it. In addition, we believe it is the duty of the Tempe City Council to acknowledge the violence that, uh, that the Tempe Police Department has inflicted on black and other minority communities 
and make tangible and substantial changes to the city's budget to end the cycle of violence. As Tempe residents, we ask that you vote against the tenant and reallocate uh, police funds to invest in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Mayor, we have an unidentified caller that might be one of our speakers. We're gonna go ahead and unmute and see if we can get a name real quick. Please state your name and place of residence for the record, please. That caller has been unmuted. Please proceed. Hello. All right. Ms. Reese, can you go to the next speaker? We have Ilsa Ortiz. Good evening, Hi, Council. Ilsa. My name is Ilsa Ortiz, and as a Tempe resident, I am here to express my concern over the proposed fiscal year 2021 budget. I ask that you allocate a minimum of 40% from the current $102,823,686 police proposed budget and invest those funds long term into human services, sustainability, and community departments. We need a budget for the people, investing in the people, and improving the lives of the people. We need to defund and demilitarize our police department, and here's why. Not only have these past two weeks shown the inefficacy of the police force, but it has brought to light what we have chosen to ignore, something that civil rights scholar and lawyer Michelle Alexandra so eloquently argues. We have not ended racial caste in America. We have merely redesigned it. And the police force has been one of its strongest allies by disproportionately targeting minorities and the black community. In order to improve our lives in Tempe, we must take a step forward and invest in our communities by funding our mental health services, affordable housing, homeless services, and sustainability to address health disparities in lower income communities. Tempe should prioritize proven community solutions over harmful punitive practices. Please reconsider the proposed budget and amend it so that it prioritizes the people's needs over the police. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Mayor, that looks like all we have in the queue that were signed up for speaker cards. I can go ahead and start reading the other items into the record if you like. Okay. If, if you, are you going to, because a lot of them may be the same one, are you going to group them together or how's that going? So, so yes, I've already pre-grouped them together. So I'll read one representation and then if you want, I can read the names of those in agreement. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, first card is Tylene A of Gilbert, Arizona. She writes, I'm writing to you as a medical student and a future physician. I am disturbed by the injustices and the brutality carried out by police officers across the country and in Arizona. The current city budget recommendation for police is nearly 103 million, an increase of almost $4 million from last year. Ending police brutality should be a priority and it should be considered as a matter of public health Instituting police reform policy is not an acceptable solution and has not worked in many other cities. I demand that you, as representatives of your constituents, pledge never to increase police budgets in the future. The budget for police departments should be decreased and the money should be directed towards schools, social services, and sustainability, which are essential for a, health, a healthy and vibrant community. Increasing police budgets have not worked in the past. We need to fund healthier programs for our community. I have several others that wrote something similar, though they may not be a physician. The body of theirs pretty much matched what she said. So those were Anna Malise of Tempe, Megan Rockwood of Tempe, Carla Kane Wissig of Tempe, Ashley DeSalt of Tempe, Tammy Wynn of Tempe, Ellie Willard of Gilbert, Sonalai of Tempe, Rhiannon Corbett of Tempe, Sarah. Sarah Jalil of Mesa, Michelle Liebert of T uh, Tempe, Evan Ippolito of Tempe, Anju Sekar of Phoenix, Emily Beach of Tempe, Carter Castile of Mesa, Rachel Castleton of Tempe, Dr. Hannah Shamlu of Tempe, Chris Allen of Tucson, Isabel Walker Littleton of Isabel Walker of Littleton, Colorado, Sarah Rockliffe of Tempe, Jessica Rothwell of Tempe, 
Edwin Tolleson, Unknown City, Samantha Rios of Tempe, Mariah Slagle of Tempe, Nicole Burleson of Apache Junction, Corey Wiltbank of Apache Junction, Malachi Corvus of Tempe, Paris Moore of Phoenix, Janelle Aquino of Phoenix, Giovanni Jayswal of Phoenix, Eric Clark of Tempe, Laura Boynton of Tempe, Lauren Green of Tempe, Garrett Unterreiner of Tempe, Jen David of Gilbert, Emily Kelly of New York, Molly Spilger of Mesa, Rocio Garcia of Tempe, and Annika Hanna of Tempe, Katie Chun Suri of Tempe, Logan Miller of Tempe, Melanie Schroeder of Tempe, Alex Potter of Mesa, Katie Pollock of Phoenix, Casey Hopkins of Phoenix, Nadia Gurry of Tempe, Jamie Wong of Tempe, Alex Jensen of Phoenix, Tristan Young John, Unknown City in Arizona, Lily Strider of Phoenix, Aaron Bay of Tempe, Monica Rangel Figueroa of Phoenix, Caroline Puckett, Unknown City in Arizona, Eli Blyman of Phoenix, Billy Erman of Tempe, Lindsay Berry of Scottsdale, Hermela Desta of Surprise, Emily Gobelich of Tempe, Taylor Marshall of Tempe, Victoria Flies of Tempe, Nicholas Matthews of Tempe, Hyde Grote of Tempe, Anna Duncan of Phoenix, Cameron McAllister of Tempe, Giovanna Ibarra of Phoenix, Alyssa Gherkin of Phoenix, Byron Ripley of Tempe, Brett Goldberg of Tempe, Chelsea Fraser of Tempe, Will Meister of Phoenix, Jessica Berson of Tempe, Kaylin Kaufman of Tempe, Amata Harding of Tempe, Emily Masick of Phoenix, Marisol Andrade, Tempe, Christina Caballero, Phoenix, Jeffrey Height, Tempe, Rachel Ann Sims, Tempe, Dana Eager Chandler, Robin Brown, Phoenix, Alex Ellis of Tempe, Stephen Azarek of Tempe. All right, thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. I, I, before we go to the next one, I, um, I do know, I believe we have Carrie Brennan on the line. Alex, if you could unmute her so that we can get, uh, she was on the list to speak and I think she was off and then she got back on, so. That is correct. Yeah. And Carrie is currently unmuted, sir. Okay, Carrie, go ahead. Hi, everyone, can you hear me okay? We can, thank Great. you. Thank you so much. Sorry that I, I missed my name being called earlier and thank you for providing the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm a resident of Tempe. I've lived for about two years now. I live on 14th Street and I just thought it was so important to speak at this session. Um, you know, I was trained in economics, so for me, everything is about opportunity cost. And when I think about that, I think about every single dollar that is currently allocated to the police, to buying things like um, militarized equipment and weapons. Every single one of those dollars, the opportunity cost is investing in our community. It could be used for our community services. It could be used for health. It could be used for housing. And I just really want to encourage everybody on council to keep that in mind. Um, I hope that you will reject the current budget plan. I hope you will reallocate all of the money that you possibly can away from the police and invest in our communities. Because again, that opportunity cost is too high to take a dollar that could be spent on strengthening our community and investing in things that we have evidence to demonstrate, make our, make our home safer and better for all of us versus investing in a police system that is just ripe for abuse and no one can come out of um, any better. So um, thank you again for giving me the time. I do hope that we will take a look at those numbers and we will really think every single dollar, how could this dollar better be used? Um, and we will, at the very least, use the funding currently allocated um, through the CARES Act and reallocate uh, whatever has been earmarked by Governor Ducey for police and fire salaries. I really hope that we will take um, that money from the general fund and reallocate it to our community and investing in the folks who, who need it most. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Madam Clerk. Okay, I have more. Okay. So this one's from Carly Golding of Tempe. 
My name is Carly Golding and I'm a resident of Tempe. I am commenting regarding the budget for the 2020 to 2021 fiscal year, specifically the 102,823,686 allocated to the Tempe Police Department. I ask that you redirect these funds to the Community Services Fund and the Human Services Fund, which are currently only being allocated 39,874,550 and 46,398,072 respectively. The police are being overfunded and these community-centered funds are vastly underfunded. The Tempe City Council should prioritize the community's universal needs, such as adequate and affordable housing, education, after-school care, mental health and trauma services, and accessible health care. Defunding Tempe PD and investing in a community services would, should be a budget priority. priority. People are marching in the streets because they know that these actions will result in a healthier and more just society. As representatives of the very members of our community that are marching for justice, it is the duty of the Tempe City Council to acknowledge the violence that the Tempe Police Department has inflicted on the black and brown communities and make tangible changes to the city's budget. As a Tempe resident, I ask that you vote against the tentative 2020-2021 budget, defund the police, and invest in our community. That's similar to one we heard on the regular council meeting, and I have several more that uh, follow suit, and I'll read the names. We have Marlena Salcida of Tempe, Brianna McKay of Chandler, Christopher Fowler of Tempe, Lauren Ellert of Phoenix, Lisa Silva of Tempe, Zach Dennis of Glendale, Jesse Whitfield of Tempe, Kathleen Fowler of Tempe, Isabella Castillo of Phoenix, Catherine Weiss of Tempe, Alex Gross of Tempe, Claire Richardson of Phoenix, John Mix of Tempe, Marcus Moxietto, Tempe, Megan Kelly, Tempe, Moon Gordy, Phoenix, Selena Chita, Tempe, Alex Bates, Tempe, Caleb of Phoenix, Colleen Jacobson of Tempe, Danielle Paulette of Tempe, Jessica Morgan Gross of Tempe, John Lincoln of Mayor, Arizona, Kailash Rahman of Glendale, Marissa Mellinger of Tempe, Nicole Hendershot of Tempe, Rana Ullman of Tempe, Jaylene Munoz of Tempe, Naleli Morales of Tempe, Stephen Orr of Tempe, Casey Merriman of Tempe, Hannah Miller Smith of Tempe, Marco Adams of Phoenix, Cecilia Wen of Tempe, Haley Rivard Lentz of Tempe, Harper Rowan of Gilbert, Natesh Puri of Tucson, Aaron Dowdy of Tempe, Benjamin Cayeros, Unknown City, Charles Sterling of Tempe, Lindsay Eck of Tempe, Melissa Nickel of Tempe, Stephanie Faircloth of Tempe, William Coleman of Tempe, Sarah Hall of Tempe, Carrie Frederick of Scottsdale, Don Tripp of Tempe, Dana Martin of Tempe, Gabriela Salinas of Tempe, Graham F. Ray of Tempe, Catlin Keberly of Tempe, Catherine Del Rosio, Rosario of Tempe, Marissa A. Mata of Phoenix, Melanie Loss of Tempe, Abigail Verdugo of Tempe, Adrian Morales of Tempe, Aquasi Owuso Doncor of Phoenix, Alexander Pimlot of Tempe, Alicia Helmrich of Tempe, Andrea Nazareno of Tempe, Anna Braden of Mesa, Ariel LeBaron of Tempe, Armando Lecon of Tempe, Audrey Nicole Ruiz of Tempe, Carrie Smith Hardy of Gilbert, Kat Cornejo of Tempe, Christopher Corbin Albin Brooks of Tempe, Cora Hildreth of Tempe, Daniel Moore of Scottsdale, Deanna Soth of Tempe, Dantine Kumar of Tempe, Edward Bowie II of Tempe, Elizabeth Marie Davidson of Scottsdale, Gabriel Espinoza of Phoenix, Hannah Duckworth of Tempe, Anna Berkovici of Tempe, Irina Levine of Phoenix, Irene Smale of Tempe, Jalona Orr of Fort Morgan, Colorado, Jessica Powers of Tempe, Jesu Kim of Tempe, Jocelyn Alvar of Tempe, Joseph Wirtz of Mesa, Catherine Sample of Phoenix, Kelly Graham of Gilbert, 
Kelsey Ponce of Peoria, Kristen Dewak of Tempe, Lauren Snyder of Tempe, Lena J of Mesa, Megan Wheeler of Tempe, Mike Faulkner, Unknown City, Lynn Elise Biddle of Phoenix, Nathan Smith of Tempe, Nicholas Pesch of Tempe, Richard Ryan of Tempe, Samantha Shannon House of Phoenix, Sarah Kruger of Phoenix, Serena Fons of Phoenix, Sophia Pacheco Forrest of Phoenix, Stephanie Voss of Tempe, Sydney Allen of Tempe, Tatiana Crespo of Tempe, Taylor Nolan of Gilbert, Therese Brennan of Tempe, Virginia McInnes, Unknown City in Arizona, William Wolf, Flagstaff, Angelique Moreno, Tempe, Cherie Warren, Tempe, Courtney Cooperknoll of Phoenix, Kara Brugman of Tempe, Marin Mueller of Tempe, Michael Pavia of Tempe, Michael Vita Dury of Phoenix, Shauna Nelson, Unknown City in Arizona, Alfonso Lopez of Tempe, Gloria Huston of Tempe, Michael Madrid of Tempe, Olivia Bartolomei of Tempe. That's that item. All right, thank you. We still have um, more. I know before you, before you go um, to the next round, I think we have a speaker that we called on earlier. Um, Isela Ortiz. Alex, are you able to get her? She's She's been unmuted and I've been seeing some sound from her. Ortiz, can, can you speak now? Oh, I already did. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> All righty. That's what I thought. Okay. Go ahead, Carla. Okay, most of the rest of these are individual perspectives, so I'll start reading those. This one comes from Coral Casillas of Tempe. She writes, I'm writing in as a Tempe homeowner, resident, and taxpayer, and an ASU graduate to express my concern with how we are allocating our city funds. This year's budget calls for a $4 million increase to the already incredibly high budget the Tempe PD already receives. I strongly oppose rewarding this department with a raise and more resources with killings of innocent Tempe civilians and minors like 14-year-old Antonio Arce. Officer Hine walks free from charges or receiving full retirement and benefits coming from our pockets. This is not okay. Mayor Mitchell, as you are on your way out, I want to urge you to use your power to do what's right. Please do not give Tempe PD a raise. Please reallocate the $4 million by creating an office for accountability and transparency and using the remaining funds to support Tempe's affordable housing fund, a real fund in need that directly impacts our communities. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Next item comes from Casey Klaus, resident of Tempe. She writes, Dear Mayor Mitchell, Vice Mayor Cuby, and council members, as a neighbor, friend, and Tempe resident residing in 85281, I am writing to express my concerns over the proposed FY2021 budget. I have heard many of you quote Joe Biden when he stated, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget, and tell me what you value, and I'll tell you what you value. I believe that each of you cares about improving the lives of Tempe residents, but I am concerned that our budget does not reflect our stated values. I ask that you amend the proposed budget to reallocate $20 million currently budgeted for the police to invest long-term in human services and sustainability, and that Tempe CARES Act, Arizona CARES Fund allocation, be used solely for short-term investments in the COVID-19 relief programs. The proposed 2021 police budget includes a nearly $4 million increase for a total of $102.8 million. The proposed general fund budget for police is $96.8 million, a $2.4 million increase from last year, and a 40.1% of discretionary spending. Tempe needs a budget that prioritizes the people. Tempe should reallocate just under 20% of the proposed budget for services that better beat the needs of the community. Police are not equipped for every situation they are currently being sent into. I ask that Tempe reallocate funds and responsibilities to departments that will better serve our community's needs, including mental health services, housing, homeless services, and sustainability to address health disparities in lower income communities. 
Rather than send police officers to poorly address mental health crises, Tepe should be sending trained, skilled, trained social workers. Crisis intervention teams reduce arrests of people with mental illness while simultaneously increasing the likelihood that individuals will receive mental health services. To implement properly, Tempe needs to make big investments in CARE 7 compared to the $963,579 from the general fund budgeted for them last year. Tempe must invest in affordable housing and homeless prevention. Last year, the, the city budgeted very little of its discretionary funds for affordable housing and homeless outreach. In order for Tempe to effectively implement a housing first strategy in addressing homelessness, it must prioritize affordable housing and homeless services in the budget. Seattle's Housing First program of providing housing and services, rather than putting homeless people in jail, actually eases their addiction, ensures they have the tools to break the cycle of homelessness, and has saved the city millions in law enforcement and emergency room costs. Alternative programs also allow police to stop spending time arresting unsheltered people for conduct that would be legal if they were inside a home, and instead focus their time on real public safety concerns. Police can leave the treatment of people in crisis to social workers, psychologists, and medical personnel, rather than taking on tasks they are neither trained nor equipped to handle. So I'm at my three minute mark, it does go on, and I'll make sure that council provided the full extent of Casey's input. I have another item here regarding performance measures in the budget. This one's from Rebecca White, resident of Tempe. She notes, I'm writing this email to express concern and outrage over increases to the Tempe Police Department that's being considered in the 2021 budget. Specifically, the budget allocates an increase of $3,975,509 to the Tempe Police Department. Tempe Police have a history of brutality and violence, like murdering 14-year-old Antonio Arce last year. Working alongside Black Lives Matter, I am demanding that, at minimum, this $4 million is reallocated towards the Office of Sustainability, the Office of Strategic Management and Diversity, Community Services, Community Development, or Human Services. I urge Tempe to advocate for policy and programs that care for our community instead of causing more violent harm, as in line with the Tempe strategic priorities of quality of life, sustainable growth and development, as well as performance measures of 1.29 and 1.30 in safe and secure communities, 2.06, 2.15, and 2.21 in strong community connections, and 5.08, 5.13, and 5.15 in financial stability and vitality. We must build upon the sustainable culture present in Tempe. It's not enough to be sustainable, but we must cultivate resilience, which will be done better through investments in community programs, and furthering progressive policies rather than investing in policing. And that's that for that card. So I have one here from Chris Vito of Tempe. He writes, Black Lives Matter, implement the legislation required to create a more just and equitable city for everyone, especially marginalized communities. Either strive to create a more perfect union in earnest or continue to disgrace it. The world is watching and history is being written. Next card is from Christine Randall, resident of Tempe. She writes, I request the mayor and city council maintain funding for the Tempe Police Department as defined in resolution 2020.63 and to adopt this resolution. We need police presence to maintain law and order in our growing and diverse city. I support the city to look for ways to improve community relations while maintaining and supporting our valuable police officers and department. They put their lives on the line every day and I am grateful. I have worked hard for what I have. I do not want to ruin my life, family, home, or property. Please do not allow what is happening in Seattle to happen here. That is not acceptable. I have another one from Kathleen McCormick, resident of Tempe. She writes, in regards to budgets and funding, I hope that you don't take serious condition to defund the police movement. They do so much for the community. It will be a loss for the residents that live in our beautiful city. If anything, they need more funding to cover things like bias training, safer subduing measures, and research into improving efficiency of investigation work so arrests could be made quicker. I've also heard because of COVID-19 that the budget itself is hurting under these crazy times. 
I'm all for increasing the tax on food for home conception by 0.05% to help our city stay beautiful and progressive. Next one is from Kevin Brown of Tempe. Kevin writes, please consider taking responsibilities away from the police department that are not able to handle effect that they are not able to handle effectively and would be better handled by human services. Also, adopt the eight can't wait guidelines. I realize Tempe already uses some of them. This will take some innovative changes in the Tempe Police Department. The Tempe is already known for being innovative. Maybe a name change for the police department that reflects these changes like you did for the fire departments. Next one is from Jaslyn Escobar of Tempe. Jaslyn writes, I believe that education is not properly funded in our community. Like many, I grew up in the public school system. I've seen how underfunded schools can be. Every teacher that I've known purchases their own school supplies for their students every year. But it's not just education, it's public health, housing, and youth services. Tempe Police is given more than what they need while other departments in this community suffer. Please redistribute the wealth ethically. In order to have a better future, we need to invest in things that can enrich our community. Let's focus on our youth and education. Let's focus on providing public health options to our citizens. Let's care and love the people who live here. Last card is from Jamie Leland of Tempe. Jamie writes, please do not create create safe communities. In fact, we have seen that they make communities that they make communities that need the most assistance less safe. Current budget clearly shows that the city of Tempe views its citizens as an entity that needs to be controlled, not a community that requires and deserves nurturing through the careful investment of their hard-earned tax dollars. Defund the Tempe PD and allocate 2021 city funds to policies and programs that will create and sustain a safe community. Mayor, that pretty much expires the content we have, but we did have 265 cards in total for this meeting that were submitted. Thank you, Carly. Thank you, Madam Clerk. All right, I'm gonna close the public comment period. And now we'll look to my council members, any discussion or comment? And then uh, I will, I'm looking for a motion on item four, and I'm gonna, I think, uh, council member, Mayor Donna Savage or Keating. Wait, hang on a second. Oh, go ahead, Randy. Sorry. Wait a minute, uh, hang on one second here. Ken, are you there? Yes, Mayor. All right, so we just close. I'm, look, I'm sorry, I had to relook at my notes here. Uh, okay, and I'm gonna look to my council colleagues now, and I either uh, who has their hand up, Council Member Keating. I don't have my hand up, Mayor. Vice Mayor Kuby. Sure, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, at first I had some questions though for Ken. Could we, uh, could I ask a few questions of Ken Jones, our finance director and deputy city manager? I'm here, uh, Vice okay, Mayor. Okay, great, yeah. So, well, Ken, I know, like, I know tonight's vote in some ways is, is a formality. It's sort of hard to explain that and communicate it. And frankly, we haven't done the best job of explaining that, that we're not, when people say, oh, there's a 4 million increase, like, no, it's not. We're, the revised budget that we're going to look at and that people can actually look at right now at tempe.gov uh, calls for 7% cuts you know, everywhere. Um, so I know that we could approve, you know, knowing it's a formality and we've begun the process for public input, but um, I know there's also an option to sort of extend the timeline uh, and just have the discussion be on June 25th and not really get into the discussion now, but just wait till we hear the community input. That's one thing that, that I'd spoken to you about. Is that still an option legally to be able to do that? And we know we have to pass a budget by the end of June or else we're out of compliance with Arizona revised statutes. So that's one of the questions I have. 
Um, but do we have another option? Like Tucson City Council did vote on Tuesday to extend their timeline to approve their budget to later in the month because they wanted to allow for more community input. I know we have the input happening, but it's just sort of confusing to people. And I've talked to a lot of residents who say, well, then why, why don't you do the formal approval on the 25th if, in fact, you have that time? So could you explain that? I will. Thank you, Vice Mayor and Council Members and Mayor. I, we, could take, we could have taken that approach. Uh, it's besides having to approve the budget by June, you also have to approve the property taxes uh, no more than or, or at least two weeks following that, which then takes us into July. I think the approach that we have taken is to, given you, to give you, the city council members, the greatest latitude to hear from folks and to have discussions and meaningful discussions. If we put the final budget approval off till June and assume that we would make every meaningful adjustment between now and June 25th, I'm afraid you would, you would sense on June 25th the pressure to, to finalize the budget. You don't have that pressure. You can make budget adjustments all year long as long mm -hmm. as you aren't increasing the overall budget. So what we're doing is saying, let's not waste our time trying to get this budget adjusted before you approve it. That's, that's a waste of staff effort and it's a waste of your time. Instead, let's just pay, pass this budget, which is, and, and let me tell you what the current budget is. It represents all of the contractual obligations that would require increases. So when people talk about a $4 million increase to the police budget, those are jail costs increasing. Those are uh, contributions to state retirement systems that are required by the city increasing. Those are all of the contractual obligations that the city has without adding personnel, without adding new equipment. It's just maintaining what we have and paying the contractual increases. That's what's before you, but we know that won't work. So what, what you will see when you look online and see what the proposed budget reductions are, we are proposing to reduce all of the department's budgets to get to that budget that we need. So. The short answer for your question, uh, Vice Mayor QB, is we could have taken a number of approaches. We're trying to take the one that gives you the most latitude to take your time and make adjustments to this budget that are meaningful and based on outcomes that you want to achieve. Mr. Mayor, can I follow up on that question? Yes, and then we're going to go to Council Member Herodano Savage. That's right. And I didn't want to ask the questions and I wanted to make a statement later, but you know, after everybody, I understand that. Thank you so much. But Ken, about the June 25th deliberations, will that will we be able to talk in detail about the 22.5 million in CARE Act funding that is passed through the governor's office? We have to use it for fire and police salaries. We get that, but then it does free up general fund money that we could use to to um, help fund our most vulnerable residents and our most vulnerable um, areas in our our city. So um, what the June 25th deliberations, will we be able to deliberate on that 22.5 million in CARE Act funding? And then I yield my time. Thank you. Uh, yes, yes, Vice Mayor, you will be able to discuss in general terms the use of those funds. Those funds are, are going to be deposited into the general fund as the governor has dictated the use of those funds. We know that $22.5 million is what will be allocated to the city of Tempe as reimbursement for police and fire salaries. We also know that we expect our revenue in the general fund to go down more than that. We, we, we definitely expect that. So the question is, do you take those funds and just apply them to balance your budget and make no cuts? That would be a mistake. We are making significant cuts to our budget combined with those funds, which are one-time funds, combined with those one-time funds so that we have the, the greatest positive impact on services and programs for our residents. So some of our existing programs and services are jeopardized by the lack of revenue or the reduction in revenue that we expect to see. So you will be given clear uh, definition at, on the 25th of what it would mean to use some of that funding to offset reductions to our current programs and services, and what it would mean to take some of that funding and apply it to new services that, that you all think um, are beneficial to the community. And, and uh, you will weigh the difference or the benefit to the community of a new program or service versus saving an existing program and service. So that discussion will take place on the 25th.
Thank you. Um, Council Member Aridano Savage. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, just a couple of things, but first, Ken, I just want to uh, ask you a quick question in regards to that CARES money. And, uh, and, and I just want to reiterate, I think it's kind of a rhetorical question because I think I know the answer. And we had a long discussion today about the Valley Metro budget um, at the Valley Metro Audit and Finance Subcommittee. And in regards to the CARES money and really understanding that this is one-time money and how that's going to be allocated in the future, we need to be very careful and thoughtful because this is not something that's gonna continue. It's going to helpfully, hopefully be a bridge so we may, can maintain services. So can you just maybe explain real quick about how the CARES money is a one-shot deal for now, um, and then hopefully how that will bridge the gap until our revenues increase? Yes, thank you, Council Member. Um, the good news is we have a model that you're very familiar with where we can plug in one-time revenue and recurring revenue, one-time expenditures and recurring expenditures. We have plugged the CARES Act funding into that model in, in different amounts to say, what would this amount mean? So for instance, it's 22 and a half million. If we said we want some new programs and services not funding to balance or to uh, save the programs and services that we have, and we spend some of that on those new programs and services, what does that leave behind in the general fund in one-time funding? And what does that mean in terms of the reductions we'll have to make? We have that interactive model and we can play with it and say, if you leave more or less of the CARES Act funding in the general fund to save existing programs and services, what does that mean in the long run? And and we, we also have a fund balance that, that allows us to make these reductions over time. If we had a crystal ball so we know exactly how deep these revenue reductions would go and we know exactly the uh, longevity of the downturn, then we wouldn't have to develop models. We would know exactly what to do. But the fact is we're projecting and, and we will plug that funding into the model. Like you said, uh, council member, one-time funding plugged into the model will save us from recurring cuts for some period of time during the first year, which is exactly how we're going to uh, ask you to apply. Okay, yeah, I, I just wanna make sure everybody knows that. And, and secondly, I know, I mean, I think we all realize, I mean, these are, these are really difficult times, you know, difficult days. There's just been a lot of emotion. I, I certainly understand that. Um, and I, I, Ken, I just wanna say, say thank you to you and to your team. Uh, unfortunately, we've kind of been through um, a budget crisis in the past, and I think that uh, because of the help of our residents, and I think because of you and the department and our employees, we were able to put ourselves in a really good position to set ourselves up as the recovery came through. So I, I just want to say thank you to you. I feel like we are in really good hands uh, financially moving forward in the sense that we are going to make some really smart choices to make sure that we're in a good position in the future and being able to maintain our services at the highest level um, you know, during this downturn. So just, just a thank you to you and your team. And, and I think those that have, have maybe come and gone already, but it really truly does make a difference and um, just a great appreciation for our employees that continue to strive to make this the best uh, community, I believe, in the state of Arizona. Um, with that said, I, I appreciate your process and your thoughts in regards to this just being a formality for right now, like necessarily a, a placeholder budget. We will always be able to make adjustments, whether it's in the next few weeks, in the next few months, or really throughout the whole entire year. Um, we'll never be able to increase our budget once it's set, but we can certainly adjust the way we spend what's in within that budget. So I, I certainly do um, appreciate that flexibility of the process and allowing us to give us time to include input from our residents. I think that's one thing that we really value and it's really important. Uh, so I certainly do uh, appreciate that opportunity to have, to, to give them the time to understand where we're at and what their priorities are and, and to understand what our strategic priorities are. You know, I'm very grateful for, for the strategic management department and the work that they've done uh, for the departments to identify different goals throughout the city and things that we've really been trying to do. I think you mentioned some of those, Ken, um, in your earlier statement, and some of those things that maybe we're falling short on. And, and I think that's gonna be really good for us to take some time and a good exercise to reevaluate uh, where we wanna spend our dollars. So uh, I'm really grateful uh, 
for the for for the strategic management department and the work that they do and the strategic goals in front of us. So I know it's going to be difficult, um, but again, I I would like to move forward with this process to give us that flexibility to give us some time to get some input and make sure that we are careful and thoughtful um, as we move forward. And with that, Mayor, I would like to move approval of item four. All right. All right, thank you, Councilman Arredondo Savage. Before we go to that, is there a second? And I need to go to Councilman Navarro. I'll second it after I just say a comment. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I it, Robin, Councilmember Arredondo Savage said was was um, spot on, making sure that you know we're going through a process, obviously with our budget. Obviously, June twenty fifth is. Um, our ability to um, really have a true discussion on on what is is going to be lined up for um, approval and how we can finesse some things. Keep in mind um, in our budget, and I think Ken has said it. There are the programs that are things that I, from what I'm hearing from the cards from our community, and I know we can do more um, within other areas that we're enhancing that we're trying to put as as top priority when we talk about things like pre-K or we talk about things mental health and social services of all kinds and trying and housing and things. These are the things that the council has put as priority and to make sure that we are um, giving our citizens the best ability to um, really blossom within our within our community. And I I don't want to say going back to the CARES Act stuff <clears throat> and it is one time money, but everyone's got to keep it in mind. Um, obviously this was not a um, decision we wanted to make and and the governments have made the decisions to to stop business so to speak so when that happens the cities are taking a drastic hit on things but the cares act money also did is it provided funding much needed funding for ppe the protective equipment that um, our um, first responders had to have our hospital workers our um, um, workers for uh, elderly and, and in home care and, and all those places that have the high potential of exposure. And what people don't know that is something that um, a mask or any protective gear that costed uh, the pennies on the dollar is now six to seven dollars. The costs have gone up exponentially because of the demand. And we had to cover that demand as a city to fund those costs and to help fund. Um, operations to help mitigate those costs on the public safety side. So there was a lot of funding that was spent just to make sure that we had the proper care and the proper um, equipment out there and to try to help minimize the contact or to help minimize the COVID um, within our community. And we are now going into an upswing of COVID. So we are going to be in a situation where our supplies are going to be even more needed and we're going to be probably paying more costs. So these costs are going to be added to the effects of our budget. So when you decide to take out, you know, this for that, you have to really understand the truth of what is it for. And you have to truly understand what the money is actually being allocated for. It's not as easy as just to take this for that and to make something better in, in certain areas. There is effects. So everyone needs to know and understand what the effects are going to have. And I think what we're going to be faced against is coming up in June 25th is we're going to make decisions. We're going to make some hard decisions on what is going to get funded, what's not going to get funded. We're going to hear from our communities and we're going to hear from our constituents. And I think this council is going to do the right thing on making sure that we are a community of diversity. We're a community that is going to be uh, encompassing um, every background every ethnicity and we're going to go forward with that so keep in mind i know that those things are going to be in the forefront of the council to make this community better and to bring this community better but we're going to make smart decisions and we're going to make budgetary decisions that are going to have a real effect on being productive not to stay, take a step back that is all all right and you seconded that right joel i seconded it Yep. Okay. So there's been a motion and a second, and I'm going to go to Council Member Keating. Thank you very much, Mayor. I want to thank um, Ken Jones for the explanation of what exactly is happening and when. Uh, it's definitely something that I tried to explain to several people today and didn't do it as succinctly uh, or as clearly as Mr. Jones did. So thank you very much for that. 
Um, I, I would like to add to it, though, that th the end of the story isn't June 25th either, because in days, in, in, in better days, we pass a budget and not have to revise it down because we were meeting our revenue expectations. And now we're kind of going in into the dark as far as what our budget's going to look like over the next uh, six months to a year, could be even longer depending on, on how long the pandemic continues to, to affect our city. So um, the way I had put it, and I think the way uh, Mr. Jones put it was we were kind of passing a ceiling budget here that we know we're going to have to reallocate funds from, and we know that we're going to have to pare down over time. And um, I think that the best we can do to communicate that to the the city at large, I think what would be helpful for all of us, not only the council members and, and the incoming new council member and incoming new mayor, but staff um, as well. Um, I am gonna vote in favor of approving the budget because as has been explained, this is only the beginning of a larger conversation. And you know, I, I just wanna add that I think we're having a moment here uh, in, in our city, our state, and our country, and I think um, that moment is one that is demanding that we take a fundamental look at what policing looks like in our society. And a lot of um, interesting points and a lot of su interesting suggestions have been brought up as far as, you know, I I'm a believer that we're asking our police to do too much. Um, and the ways that we could sh have other city departments and other trained staff deal with that, and I think a benefit to everybody. So I am committed to um, working with the new council and bringing forth sub substantive and meaningful reforms along with our community stakeholders, our community partners, our police chief, and our police union and the men and women that actually police the streets of Tempe. And I think that's something that we can do given the moment that we're in. So I'm looking forward to working on that and I'm also looking forward to a continued public dialogue in what what our budget ends up looking like. Um, but you know, I just I'm just very impressed with the way that it's been presented tonight because there are a lot of questions um, about uh, this process. And again, anything we can do to communicate that to the folks that have reached out to us, um, I think we should. So we have several thousand emails, and I do hope. That there is, and I assume that there is, because I know how, how good our staff is with responding to everybody, that there is a plan to uh, communicate exactly what tonight is and the larger process that we're all going to go through in the months and, and frankly, years to come as we take a, a deep look at what exactly um, the city can do to meet the needs of um, our residents. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Councilmember Keating. And before I go to another council member, I, I want to make a couple of comments. And, and I really want to appreciate, uh, I really do appreciate uh, Ken Jones, your staff, you know, putting everything together that we have uh, in front of us. Um, I, you know, this is one of the most important things we do as a city uh, is to make sure that we're creating a budget that fits our strategic priorities for our community. And we, you know, we're in unprecedented times, has been said. We're very fortunate to be, as Councilman Arredondo said, to be in the position we are in um, with the success we've had in our community uh, as it relates to uh, the economy and the services that we provide uh, to our community as well. You know, as was stated earlier by Mr. Jones, passing this budget is a formality to confirm with state law, but we all know that we'll be making changes to the budget at the upcoming uh, meeting on June 25th and beyond June 25th because of the unprecedented times that we are facing uh, with the city. We'll be examining how to cut at a minimum $14 million out of the budget that we're looking at this evening. We also know that any changes uh, that need to be made, um, uh, we need to also be considered that the programs need to be thought out and based upon the needs as well as the public input that we will receive. It's gonna take some time to move forward through a process regarding what certain programs would look like, as opposed to just throwing money at it. We need to make sure that um, we are being thoughtful and we need to look at all the considerations if 
because we're going to be making these cuts and we're going to have to be look, shifting monies from one area to another area and what that impact will mean not only to the priorities that this council and the next council will have in terms of priorities, but also the commitment that our residents expect from us um, is so important. So with that, I know Lauren, you had a hand up, but you spoke already. Before I go back to you, uh, Councilmember Adam has her hand up and then I'll come back to you, Count, uh, Vice Mayor Cuby. Uh, Councilmember Adams. Yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we have so much going on right now with the COVID and uh, the protest and uh, just a lot of moving parts. And I just want us to be as transparent as possible and support our community. And I agree with uh, Council Member Keating that we are asking our police to do a lot and I think it's too much. And I think uh, to try to look at how we can make that situation better would be really helpful. Uh, but like I said, the most important thing is that we're careful with our budget because we are going to be under um, some restrictions as far as the budget goes. And I just want to communicate with our, our, uh, our community as much as possible and get their input um, before we make final decisions. Thank you. Thanks. Vice Mayor Keevy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My first comments were more questions for Ken, but um, so, so it feels like there's it feels like centuries of injustice, generations of organizing and, and pain have come to a head in these past few weeks. And what has long been clear is now is now undeniable. It's time to reimagine public safety beyond policing. We, we need to shift our thinking and our practices to decouple safety from policing. And we need to reallocate resources to that new vision that I believe is is being formulated in the minds of so many Americans. We've received thousands of emails, more emails than I've ever seen in my five years on council. And my, I have to say my initial reaction to a suggestion of defunding the police was to think, well, that's not practical. What does that mean? Does that mean, you know, no more police? That I can't see that possible. But what I've come to learn is that defunding the police does not mean getting rid of the police altogether. Maybe it does for some, but I think it does not mean that. It rather, it means, it means realigning police budgets and reallocating funds, certain funds to crucial and neglected areas like in education, as people have mentioned, public health, housing, youth services, and this movement. And maybe some have criticized the, the, the hashtag, you know, but it's certainly attracted attention. Maybe that's what it was meant to do. But um, the idea of defunding is predicated on the belief that communities and nonprofits are a better deterrent to crime by directly addressing societal problems like poverty, mental health, mental illness, homelessness, issues that we've been tasking police with. And as Council Member Keating said, maybe we've been tasking police with too many of these issues. According to some estimates, law enforcement spends about 20% of its time responding to and transporting people with mental illnesses. I spoke to our TOA officer who mentioned that there's a requirement that Police have to escort mental health patients to um, facilities. It, you know, it's just, they act like a transport service. Like that doesn't make sense. So I think Tempe's in a position to really lead on this issue as uh, council member Keating so eloquently stated, and we can begin to reimagine what an equitable and racially just public safety could look like, but it's not gonna be done in one meeting or two meetings. It's not gonna be done by June 25th or just, lopping off a percentage of funds from PD without having developed a, like a real plan, like you were saying, I, I, Mayor Mitchell, for how to spend it better and how to spend it smarter. For example, you know, we have, some people are recommending a cut of 20%. Uh, well, we have 100%, 103% increase in aggravated domestic assault calls. That isn't something a social worker can take care of. So we need to be really careful of, about how we go forward and plan. So what I, what I ultimately hope to see happen is that we're going to work with our community and with our subject matter experts in social justice organizations to give the people of Tempe much more, much more than what they're asking for tonight. I, I really think, as Councilmember Keating mentioned, this is a historic time in our city, in our country. Everyone's watching and listening and, and realizing this isn't just a mo moment, it's a movement. And, it, and, and frankly, it's exciting to see so many people peacefully protesting. That's been the rule. And, um, and we've been seeing how important, people are seeing how important it is to engage in local government, but local government has so much to do with the quality of your life and with justice. 
So I and others will be relentless in our pursuit of change. I am passionate about it. I'm not going to waste a minute in getting started. And, but if we rush this and we get it wrong, if we just make an, an X and X to the budget and, and kind of dismantle this whole Jenga of a budget that's like I have never seen in my history on the council, a budget that's going to be continually evolving over the past six months, most likely, it's going to be so much harder if, if we rush it to go back later and take another swing at it. So all I'm asking from the community is just a little bit of trust in our resolve and a little bit of time to get this right. You know, we're having a new council on, on July 2nd too, and we have to absorb all this and work with our new council. So I can approve tonight's initial operating budget. I know it's a formality. It's statutorily required. June 25th is, is deliberation day. I know that we've just begun the process of asking for public input in a serious and concerted way. And I know that once we begin to process the process to dismantle systemic racism throughout our city, and we can't, we're not unique. We all, we all have systemic racism in our city. And it's not just addressed through police reforms. It's not just in our police department. We have to look at every aspect of our city. We have to take a deep dive into policy and procedures and also into the heart of who we are as a city. We know so much. We can't turn away and now we need to act. So with that, I say I will approve the um, operating budget for today and look forward to our discussions on June 25th. All righty. Um, thank you all for the comments. Anybody else? If not, we have a motion and a second. I'm going to go ahead and do a roll call vote. Councilman Navarro. Councilman Navarro. Councilmember Keating. Yes. Councilmember Chin. Aye. Vice Mayor Kiwi. Aye. Councilmember Eric Dondo Savage. Aye. Councilmember Adams. Aye. I vote aye. Councilmember Navarro. Councilmember Navarro. Aye. Aye. There you go. That motion passes. Uh, seven to zero. I want to thank again our staff and our constituents uh, for their comments. I will now um, we will now adjourn this meeting. Thank you all very much, and I'm glad. Uh, I, I want to appreciate the peaceful protests that we had. And I know we had some great. Uh, colleagues out helping the protests. We had water stations out there. So thank you for all of our city staff. I'm glad it was a peaceful protest and, and we're gonna to continue to listen to our residents as we move our, this great city forward. With that, we are adjourned. <laughs>